Today uh, we are going to be talking about race, race relations, um, black leadership uh, in the United States in the post civil war post civil war. Post civil war. I'm going away. Goodbye. Post civil war world. Uh, so we are going to be looking kind of at the dates, 1877 to 1929. Um, 1870, and we're going to kind of differentiate between North and South. Um, and we're going to talk about kind of what the life was like and then responses to that life uh, among American blacks uh, and their leadership. Um, and that's kind of where we're going today. 1877 is an important date, um, which is what? What does 1877 uh, mark the end of? Um, Reconstruction. Reconstruction, very good. 1877 marks kind of the end of the Civil War era and Reconstruction. And then what happens in the South after Reconstruction is over? What do we call that? All the way so long ago in Block 5. What's at the end or right before the break? What's that word? Yeah, Diani. Yeah, very good, Diani. Redemption. Um, <laughs> Southern redemption, the <laughs> regaining of control of the southern states by uh, white Democrats in the South um, is called redemption. So we're going to start, and what's 1929? The start of uh, the Great Depression, the start of the Great Depression. Um, all right, so. We're going to start our kind of look at American race, race relations um, in the South. The South of 1877, um, over 90% of American blacks live in the South until World War I. They do not move north in great numbers after the Civil War. They do not move west in great numbers after the Civil War. The census of 1910 still showed 90% of American blacks living in the former states of the Confederacy. So we're dealing with most black Americans at this time. And tell me about, we, we know some stuff that went on. What goes on in Southern Redemption in these 20 years between 1877 and 1896. There's a lot. Okay, um, can we go broader first before we get narrow um, like that? So what's one of the, there's a couple, so the goal, if you will, let's start there. Then. The goal of redemption is to turn the freed slaves into second class citizens. How, there's a couple steps that get undertaken to achieve this goal. No, no, no. Oh, oh. Start, the, the, oh, just wrong. Start broad, oh, broad. and come narrow. Uh, Jim Crow? Jim Crow. All right, well, Jim Crow is going to be number two. What is, what is Jim Crow? What is Jim Crow? Oh, Laws. Laws that do what? Limit the black's rights. It's very specific. What do Jim Crow laws do? They establish what? What is Jim Crow? It's a set of laws, not a stereotype of anything. No, it it not is not something. It is a system of laws that provide for what fact? Segregation. Segregation. Jim Crow are the laws that provide for segregation. Okay? And we've all experienced enough American history to know. Look, you know, you can't, 
you know, separate schools, separate train cars, separate movie theaters, separate waterfront. We know what it looks like. Whites only, blacks only. Okay? Segregation. According to the, according to the Supreme Court case, what Supreme Court case um, guarantees, what Supreme Court case determines that segregation is constitutional? What Supreme Court case determines this to be constitutional? Plessy v. Ferguson. Very good. Okay. So, Plessy v. Ferguson establishes the constitutional standard that, se that segregation is fine as long as the accommodations for both races are what? Separate but equal. So it's fine to have a black school and a white school, but the black school and the white school have to be measurably equal. That's what the law says. As the law is interpreted and enforced, there is very little equality to be had. That the black school is going to be quantitatively very different from the white school. That the black movie theater is going to look different, the black railroad car is going to look different, or the black hotel is going to look. The I'm sorry. Phone? Yeah, the, I saw a picture one time, and the um, the, the black water fountain was like all the way at the bottom, mm -hmm. and then and it was so small, and the white water fountain was all the way up top, like level. Okay. Right. Exactly. So just a, a lifetime of both major and minor indignities put upon this population of blacks in the South. And we're all, I think we all recognize that although the law says separate but equal, there is very little equal and there is a whole lot of separate. But something has to happen before, and if you notice, Plessy v. Ferguson is 1896. It takes 20 years for this system to be put into place and then be, to be determined to be constitutional. So something has to happen to blacks in the South before Jim Crow kind of really gets rolling. What, does, what, do you, what has to happen, what also kind of happens that will pave the way for Jim Crow? People, the North stopped caring about the South. Okay, well that's the end of Reconstruction. We have that, that's absolutely true. That's kind of a medium term cause, Kevin's okay, right, but what has to happen right before that paves the way, sets the stage uh, for Jim Crow? How do these laws get passed? I don't know, Supreme Court would pass laws. Oh, no, no, state. Yeah, the state of Alabama writes a law. Okay, so what has to happen before Jim Crow gets passed? Is it that, um, like, people <clears throat> that were for, like, Confederates, they were put back in power? And how is that going to take place? If the African Americans are no longer given the right to vote? Big Before you do Jim Crow, you have to restrict voting rights uh, for the freed slaves. Loss. Mm -hmm. Voting rights. And hopefully you remember things like the poll tax, the literacy tests, the grandfather clauses. Once you remove blacks' right to vote, then you can start passing these laws that further restrict their rights. And if you really kind of look at it like this, this is the undoing of Reconstruction. It's the undoing of the 15th Amendment, which guarantees that race will no longer be a barrier to voting. And then Jim Crow is a violation of the 14th Amendment, equal protection of the laws, and equality of citizenship. This is the undoing of Reconstruction. Now, what else is going on in the lives of black Americans in the South? Generally speaking, economic poverty. 
What do most freed slaves end up doing in the post bellum South? They go back to what they were masters. Sharecropping. Very often for their old masters. I just didn't remember some stuff. Yeah. Sharecropping. That it's an economically, and look, this is for poor whites too. Most people in the South are poor, most of them are picking cotton. Whites and blacks. <laughs> Sharecropping is an inefficient economic system where it's impossible to accumulate capital. And who is still running the South? The elites, the planter elite. We don't have an industrial elite in the South. We don't have a middle class elite in the South. It's still, from the colonial times, this planter, landowning elite that's running the South. All of these things, all of these things are enforced both by law and by custom. And the clan enforces custom. And custom develops. And the, and the term that the Klan would have used is blacks need to know their place and to stay in their place. And their place is down there. And if they stay in their place, then they won't be bought. But if they get uppity, again, the word that would have been used, they get a little uppity, don't think that they belong down there, then, and there's a million different small and large indignities that a black man can't be called Mr. Like, that seems so simple, but a white person in the South would not call a black man Mr. You know what we call him? Boy. Boy if he's young, if he's not. Uncle. Uncle Tom Scavenger. Well, like an uncle. Well, right. But that's so uh, uh, a, a black man, a black Man, 20 and below would be boy, and above, as an adult, be uncle, not mister. Wait, 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 is that because of uncle? No. Just, just, how, how does language ever develop? No one ever sits there and says, we're going to call, it just, that's what, how it developed. Okay? I'm not enough of a linguistic historian to give you any better answer than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Answer the question. I don't know. I, when I don't know, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know the answer. Um, uh, we'll see if you can find out. Sit up. I don't know. Um, there's innumerable numbers of social mores that define that define the segregated South. If you violate the law of segregation, you will be arrested. Okay, that's the law. It's the law that you know that segregation. It's the law that you can't go into the movie theater through that door. And it's the law that so you break that law, you get arrested. But the Klan enforces the norms. The norms like black men don't look at white women. That's a norm. Your eyes linger a little too long on a pretty white girl, and that night you will get a visit from the local clan who will burn a cross on your front lawn. Or beat you to death. No, no, no. They're, they're going to warn you first. The, fir the cross burning is the warning. If you. Sorry, we we're just discussing the boy that got beat, and then they like show the picture of him. Number two. Number two. Number two. Look, one of the things I've tried to impress upon you throughout the course of this class is there's not a clan manual. Okay? It's not like you know, Joe Schmo violated section 13A, meaning he looked at a white girl for three seconds or less. His penalty is a crossword. 
Section 3B, he looked at a white woman for five to seven seconds, which means a cross burning and a beating. This is not how it works. Okay? Wrestling training. When we talk about what the clan does, we understand that the clan is this vast, diffuse organization. So in one town, the clan's going to act a little differently than the clan does in the next town versus the next towns. The difference between look, the difference between a and a look and you know a little grab of the ass might be the difference between the burnt and a beating. There's no rules, though. So we can, we're not going to sit here and say, this is what they did in this circuit. The fact of the matter is, if you violated the norms, then you would be warned or punished or both. And if you were accused of, we're going to get back to what Ryan was talking about, lynching was the penalty for an allegation of rape against a white girl. That if they, if, if the local clan got it in its head that a black man had had sex with a white woman, whether that was forced or consensual, the penalty for that is a lynching. Whether it happened, and look, and we all know how rumors spread, and you know, maybe this black guy, you know, was making himself a pain in the ass. Well, we can make up an accusation. He looked dirty at my sister. Let's go get him. It's not a law. There's no courtroom. And the ultimate penalty dished out by the clan was lynching. Happened thousands of times throughout the South in these 50 years. Not an everyday occurrence. The chance of a black person in the South getting lynched is very, 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 very small in terms of percentages, it happens thousands of times in these 50 years. At the very worst, you average one a day in the entire South. Which is a lot. But again, this is not a mass movement. So this, this is black life in the South in one way of looking at it. Now we have to look at it also kind of from a different perspective. What else is going on in the South? Literacy. Pretty much the first thing, the second thing black freed slaves tried to do was educate themselves. The first thing was put families back together that had been split. Second thing was you get literacy. Schools and colleges. This is where you have the founding and the survival and the growth of historically black colleges in the South. Uh, by, the, by 1930, black literacy rates are pretty much equivalent to white literacy rates in the South. And you have a small but vibrant middle class in the South. That, you know, and, and, and that makes sense. You know, if you're, if there's only one store for both blacks and whites, one of those small, but this to me would be one of the most annoying indignities, that you can't be served in a store. So you, you come into the store, you're waiting to pay for your purchase, you don't pay until every white person is offline. And any white person pretty much has the right to cut you, and you get rung up when all the other white people are out of the store. That would be, to me, like the most annoying thing in the universe, just, pretty much. Just waiting in line is just terrible. What is the usual line? Okay. So, obviously, there's going to be a market here for black businesses. You know, anyone that got a little bit of capital together. They're going to get a lot of business if they start their own store where you pay based on when you've got a line. 
So there's going to be, you know, a black middle class, not huge, but important and vibrant um, in the South. Every black town and city is going to have, you know, a black section of town where you can go to shop and eat and get your hair cut, you know, in places where you don't have to worry about being treated like a non-person. Uh, and those people are going to kind of become, in a way, the leadership of local individual communities. You also get uh, powerful Christianity, that black churches, like they do to this very day, are kind of the cultural home base for black communities in the South. And a combination of business leaders, these college-educated, um, graduates, business leaders, and the ministers of black churches are going to be the leadership of black communities in the South. Now, so when we look at this, we have to balance it with this. Uh, we should also make a point to recognize that in the South, uh, black crime rates were similar to that of whites. Um, black, blacks got and stayed married um, at similar rates to whites in the postbellum South. Um, got and stayed married. Uh, so, in some of some very important social indicators, like I said earlier, literacy, literacy, marriage, crime, black rates in the South and white rates in the South are not significantly different. They will become different in the 20th century, as we know. Uh, but as for now, they are not. That's the South. Black experience in the North is very, very different. Not in terms of the racism of the white people around them because most people in the North are just as racist as most people in the South. Blacks in the North number only about 10% of the entire black population, and it's a much smaller percentage of the total population of the North. Where do blacks live in the North? In the South, blacks are rural. In the North, blacks are urban. Blacks live in Northern cities. There's not many black farmers in Ohio. There's not many blacks living in small towns in Michigan. Most blacks in the North are concentrated in cities, and within those cities, they live in their own ethnic neighborhoods, which come to be called ghettos, which is not originally, like you said, a negative term. It's just saying that the saying is the black ghetto is the same as saying Chinatown, or Little Italy. That's where black people live. Italians lived in the Lily, Jews lived in the Lower East Side, every ethnic group has its neighborhood. Black neighborhoods called ghettos. The difference, and as we know, ethnic neighborhoods kind of maintain their own structures not necessarily integrated with the rest of the city. That in Little Italy, the newspapers you know, are in Italian, they're designed for Italians, the schools are Italian, the restaurants are Italian, the business owners are all Italian. Well, in the ghetto, the newspapers are written for that community, the schools are filled up with you know, black children, the businesses are, because that's where they live. That's how cities are. Cities are divided into ethnic neighborhoods. Wards are political. Neighborhoods are organic. So when I draw the 12th ward, somebody, some politician drew that on a map. Little Italians moved to Little Italy. Why? Because there are Italians there. I don't give a flying canoodle what war it's in. They moved there because there's other Italians there. The difference, guys, In the North, there's no legal segregation. There's no Jim Crow in the North. Okay? 
There's no laws saying black people can't ride a subway in the same car. And, and, and there are no laws like that. But the North, in a lot of ways, is just as segregated as the South because it's segregated by ethnicity. In black, in schools in the South, they're segregated because the law says the white kids in this county go to this school and the black kids in this county go to this school. But in Little Italy, how do schools work in an urban setting like Elizabeth? You go to school based on where you live. Well, the schools that are in the ghetto are filled up with black students. The schools that are in Chinatown are filled up with Chinese students. That it's segregated not based on law, but it's segregated based simply on geography. Okay, so it's uh, social segregation, not legal segregation. And there are no black people ride the subway just like anybody else. You know, in New York City in the 1910s. But in terms of things like schools and businesses, they're segregated because those things in urban areas kind of get based on your geographic location. Here's the difference, though. The difference is when you try to leave. When an Irish guy gets tired of the neighborhood, he does, not have a, he does not have trouble buying a house anywhere he so desires. Because you can pretty easily not play up the fact that you're Irish after three generations. You sound pretty much like anybody else. You look like pretty much anybody else. And nobody knows you're Irish unless you want to make it known that you are Irish. Black people can't do that. You walk into the room, hi, you're black. <laughs> There's no hiding it. Michael Jackson, only person in history, started out a black man, ended up a white woman. <laughs> <laughs> there are two things that prevent middle-class blacks, once they had the money to do so from leaving their ethnic neighborhoods. One is a, is a, a, one is a practice called redlining. And the other is simply social pressure. So let's talk about this first one. Applying for a mortgage is one of the most time-consuming and pain-in-the-ass things that you will ever do. Take your FAFSA and multiply it by 100. Your, your what? Or, uh, your FAFSA, which you haven't even addressed yet. That's how you apply for financial aid. When you apply for a mortgage, the bank asks you a series of 583 questions. They ask you to get you know, dozens of documents together, send them to them. And so my wife and I did this. And then they sent us a nothing. So they reviewed our documents. And then they sent us back a list of 15 things that they weren't sure about, respond to 15 A, B, C, D. By the end of this process, if they had said, send us your firstborn child, I would have been fine. <laughs> Any, so redlining, what redlining is, is denial of mortgages for black people, pretty much. And it's not, it's illegal. But it's a rule that everybody knew existed and nobody talked about. Because in that process, you can throw a wrench into that process anywhere you want. It's so complicated. So, you know, you can say, oh, look, there's a rule that if your income for falls below 70% of your average income over a 10-year period for any one year in that two years, you'll get more. And there's so many rules, and it's so hard to fight that basically, black people who try to move out of their neighborhoods, no one said, we're rejecting this mortgage because you're black. 
They said, we're rejecting this mortgage because you didn't fall into the criteria of 74 Part C, subparagraph 2. Well, by the time you get to you know, subsection C, paragraph 70, like, what are you going to do about it? You know? That's redlining. The other issue is if you do somehow manage to move out and move into another different neighborhood, there's no other way to put this. The people who live there then probably don't want you um, and are not going to make your life there pleasant and pleasurable. Some of you have read Raisin in the Sun, perhaps? Connect literature to history. You know, people who write literature obviously write literature coming from a life lived in history. Being the first black family in a neighborhood is not easy. And it takes quite a bit of moral and very often physical courage to do so. So if you're a black family with little kids, you don't, you don't want your little kids necessarily to, you know, to, to get beat up you know, every day when they go to school. So you don't, it takes, the point is it takes quite a bit of moral and physical courage to, to do that, to be the first you know, black family to move out into you know, a neighborhood where black people had not lived before. So those things put together are going to keep blacks in the north segregated in neighborhoods in cities. Any question here? Harlem Renaissance needs to be touched. Blacks start to move out of the South during World War I. Okay? So you pretty much have stable populations for the, what, 35, 50 years after the Civil War. For 50 years after the Civil War, nobody's, it's, it's actually kind of interesting down gradually. For 50 years after the Civil War, no one's moving in or out of the South. White Southerners are staying in the South and no one's coming. Black Southerners are staying in the South and none are leaving, coming, etc. But during World War I, there is a labor shortage in the North, and for the first time, you're going to see a stream, not a flood, but a stream of Southern blacks saying opportunities in the factories in the North are better than sharecropping and picking cotton for my entire life, and I'm going to move North. And they move to where the factories are, which is where the cities are. And anyone who moves into a new neighborhood is going to want to move near people like him or her. So blacks from the south come and start moving into the north, and they move into these neighborhoods that are already there. That's, that movement, movement always creates dynamism. Dynamism leads to cultural things happening. The Harlem Renaissance. is kind of kicked off by this movement by southern blacks into northern cities. What are we laughing at? Put your foot down, sit like more people, thank you. Jazz, poetry, Langston Hughes, you know, we are aware of the characters of the Harlem Renaissance. It's this cultural flower. Uh, and makes Harlem into kind of the capital um, of black America. As a way of segue into what we're going to be talking about in the later block. One of the many issues that's going to lead to, on some people's questions, you know, when did the ghetto become like the ghetto, what we think of when we think of the ghetto? Um, one of the first things that happens is all these people moving into one neighborhood that doesn't get any bigger because the redlining doesn't allow for the black community to spread out 
very much. So you start, pe movement of people is, some, is good, but when the people start clumping in together, you start to get significant overcrowding, that's when you're going to start to see problems start to develop. Uh, because the black community is not really welcome to spread into areas that it, it was not originally. Um, and that's going to be one of the problems. Uh, but that's for a, a later block. But Harlem Renaissance is kind of kicked off um, by this movement of Southern blacks to the point. So here's a look, south and north, very broad-based, on what race and race relations are looking at. Now, the last thing I want to do today is kind of discuss three different is discuss three different approaches as to what is what should the goal be for Black Americans in this in the country that's treating them this way, both north and south. And we're going to talk about three different people because they represent three different ideologies. Over to Washington, Billy Dee Dee Dubois. I thought his name was Dubois. I mean, Dubois. Exactly. And Mark is Booker T. Washington has one of those personal stories that you kind of look at it and say, I am really not doing anything with life. Um, Booker T. Washington is born us. Now, one of the things that makes them different, we're going to put some dates on them. Booker T. Washington is older than the other two. Booker D. Washington is a generation older than the other two, which explains to some degree the difference in him and the other two. Booker D. Washington is what we call an accommodationist. What does it mean to accommodate? To accommodate. To accept. Good. If you accommodate something, you, even if you don't like it, you accept it and deal with it and move forward from there. Basically, Booker T. Washington's, Booker T. Washington shares W.E.B. Du Bois's goal of equality and integration and like, civil rights. Wait, but, 1930? Sorry? 1910 to 1930. 1910 to 1930. 20 years. Well, he ended up in jail. Oh, no. oh. Um, Booker T. Washington kind of looks at the state of America and says, white people are not particularly close to accepting us as equals in this country. And he starts then and says to sit there and jump, jump up and down and yell and scream that we want equality might be true and it might be and it might feel good, but it's not gonna get us anywhere. That we have to accept the fact that black people in the United States 12% of the population, 88% of the American population is white, and we don't even have the right to vote in most places in the South. So although it would be great to have these things, if I actually want to help actual people. We just have to accommodate ourselves to this unfortunate fact. And what Booker T. Washington, he, 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 he takes what, you know, in a lot of ways is the long view, in his own mind at least. Um, and like this, he has this really this amazing story. Um, he's born into slavery. Um, after the Civil War, he kind of decides, um, probably in the 1880s, about 1880. 70 or 80. Where are they? Um, how, this after the Civil War, how's he going to stay? Well, he was, and as a child, he was a slave. 1970. 1970. 1870. 
I'm not giving dates of life. Oh, I'm giving yeah, dates of like activity. Oh. I thought I was like, oh. poor Marcus, he died at 20. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> This is dates of activity, not life dates. Oh. Dubois dies in 1980. W.B. Dubois, I think, is he lives to be 100, I think. He dies in 1963. Uh, this is their activity. Anyway, W.B. Dubois. Uh, anyway, Bernie Washington, born a slave. Um, Decides very early on that a life of picking cotton and sharecropping is not for him. He leaves home, goes to St. Louis, which is a very southern city in a lot of ways. Um, is so poor that he only has enough money to either have a roof over his head or to go to school. And he decides that he'd rather be homeless and go to school than not go to school and have a roof over his head. So for, you know, for not a, a not inconsiderate amount of time, uh, he slept on the street and went to school kind of during the day and worked at night. Um, and got himself an education. Uh, he was a very, very smart guy, really guy, you know, to begin with. Um, and he dedicated his life uh, to this long view that if black America was economically and culturally successful, then eventually, white America would notice and be like, oh yeah, I guess you guys are equal. That in order to get political and civil equality, black people had to be just as wealthy and just as culturally productive as white people. And that's Booker T. Washington's thing. And in pursuit of that goal, He's the, he founds the Tuskegee Institute, you know, which is an institute to improve agriculture in the South. Um, it's an institute to provide education, farming education, so that black people could farm more efficiently, and to farm more productively, uh, to make more money off of the products that they sold, to take farm products. We all know George Washington Carver. He works at the Tuskegee Institute. George Washington Carver's deal is making taking the products that are made by people in the South and making them more valuable. That's Booker T. Washington, that eventually, given economic and cultural equality, political and civil equality will come. And he, when he supported all those black colleges in the South. He founded this, this Tuskegee Institute. Uh, and that's, that's Booker T. Washington. Basically, he said they pick up your lunch pail was kind of his slogan. Get to work. And it's only through productive and successful work that we will be accepted by the white majority in the United States. Dubois comes from a completely different place. He's from the North. But not only is he from the North, he's from Boston. He is from the, he, he's a progressive, he's an elitist. He is, what's, he's an integrationist. Integration is the opposite of, what's the opposite of integrate? Segregate. Segregate. Segregation is the dividing of the races, integration is the bringing together of the races. Dubois circulates in the tip, he's a Harvard graduate, he circulates in the tippy top regions of Boston society. His parents were abolitionists. Boston, if you remember, is the home of William Lloyd Garrison, the liberator, abolition. Massachusetts is the heart of the abolitionist movement. And Dubois is at the heart of that progressive group of people who, they're, well, they're elitists. Um, and what they want is complete integration, legal integration, right now. And Dubois is instrumental in founding the NAACP, which is an organization founded in Boston, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. 
it is a legal and elite group in the sense that he's going to attack segregation, redlining through the court system, legally. He's going to make learned arguments in front of learned judges. He believes, and he's a progressive to the hilt, meaning he has very little time for ordinary folks. He believes in what he calls the talented tenth. He says, look, 90% of black people can't do anything to help themselves. They need, this is, he's a progressive. That's what makes you a progressive. The belief that you need to be led into a better future by people smarter than you. He would, Dubois says, we're going to take the most talented, most able 10% of America's black population, and they will be the leaders of bringing the rest of the black community into this integrated, equal future with the rest of the country. And that's what the NAACP does. It argues court cases um, and does things kind of on that educated, elite level. Talented 10. Um, he's a progressive, start to finish. Um, I don't even I can't, I don't even know how long it was in his life that he even visited the South. Um, he hung out in the you know company of elite progressive Bostonians. That was his people, and it is to the credit of elite Bostonians that he was simply accepted, not based on his intelligence and not based on his skin color, as many elites, you know, in Boston were. Boston is a city at its elite level, at least, that for a very long time believed in racial equality. Um, not necessarily at its, you know, its Irish and Italian immigrant level, but definitely amongst its elites. Marcus Garvey is the third of our group. He is a separatist. Marcus Garvey says, black people are not going to get a fair shake in this country either now or later. And the best thing to do is to separate. Um, and he is the 1920s version of the Back to Africa movie. The type of person that is impossible to miss. He's tall. He's big, he's got a big mustache, he designed and he has this booming voice, he's funny, he's a good speaker, he designed his own military uniform. So whenever he was like out and about, he's in this gigantic hat and military uniform, and his thing was, let's leave America and go back to Africa where things are going to be a lot better for us, we don't have to deal with all of this racism. Uh, he went. So he started a, uh, an association and a company. Went so far to start a steamship line um, that took people who were willing to pay from the United States back to Africa. Uh, he called it the Black Star Line, which was kind of a play on the White Star Line, which was like the, the Titanic. That was the company that owned Titanic, the White Star Line. So he called it the Black Star Line. Um, a crook. This was kind of his undoing, that he was one of those types. Um, here's a dollar for my steamship company. Here's a dollar for me. Here's a dollar for my steamship company. Here's a dollar for me. Um, and ended up getting thrown in prison for fraud. Um, what makes him important, though, and why we have, is, is something that's very hard to quantify. When we look at history, to, or when we look at the world, a lot of us like to know numbers. Was there economic growth? Yes, the economy grew 3.2% this year. You know, 85.2% of people who are looking for work are, whatever, we like numbers. But there's a lot of life that is not capturable easily in numbers. And what Marcus Garvey kind of gives to our story here is he makes no excuses for being black. He says, being black is cool. Being black is fine. There's nothing to apologize for here. 
be proud of who you are and where you've come from and what you've done. It, it brings out, black is beautiful, Marcus Garvey says, and he makes no apology for yelling it very loudly to a lot of people. And it brings to an entire generation, whether they agree with his idea that we should all go back to Africa or not, he brought about quite a bit of cultural confidence. Which is a very hard thing to put a number on. How do you, how do you measure how much cultural confidence somebody has? It's hard. But that's kind of what he brings to this story. And I'm going to submit to you that, uh, look, fact of the matter is, during the 1920s and 30s, none of these people were successful. You know, the 20s and 30s are some of the worst decades for American race relations in our history. That, you know, blacks were succeeding, you know, to some degree economically and culturally, but they were no closer to being accepted you know, segregation was still the rule of the land. Garvey himself ended up in prison. Only a handful of blacks actually ever went to Africa. So we look at these three and we say, did they have, you know, successes in their time and place in the 1920s and 30s? And the answer is kind of not really. But I submit to you this last idea. To create the civil rights movement, which is coming in the late 1940s, to create the civil rights movement, you needed all three. You needed all three ingredients. You needed the idea of economic and cultural autonomy. And you needed that elite group who's going to be able to argue things in front of the Supreme Court. And you also needed ordinary black Americans not to have to apologize for who they are. You take those three things and then you throw into the mixture that during World War II, the United States went on this crusade to rid the world of the racist in chief, Hitler. And that's kind of the last piece of the puzzle that's going to launch the civil rights movement right after World War II ends. You have these things that are there. Add to that the mixing of America due to World War II, because there was a lot of mixing in America during World War II. Add to that the fact that it was Hitler, of all people, Mr. Racialist himself, who saw the entire world through racial terms. And you have the recipes for the Civil Rights Movement. Any questions on that? Yeah. Were, the jails segregated? Were jails segregated?